welcome. Uh, my name is Achilles Saltus. I'm the president of the Democracy and Culture Foundation. And uh, we convene Art for Tomorrow, normally in association with the New York Times. Um, really glad to be here. Uh, it feels like a bit of a homecoming. Uh, many of you will remember that uh, the Art for Tomorrow conference was actually started, it was founded at the New York Times back in 2015, uh, and in partnership with uh, Shaker al Magasa and uh, Qatar Museums. Uh, since then, we've been to Berlin. We were in Athens just uh, recently. We'll be going to uh, Florence, Italy uh, next, uh, next year. Uh, so every year we try to choose a, a different destination. And here we are back in, in Doha with uh, a brand extension of the Art for Tomorrow conference, which are our Art for Tomorrow talks. So we have uh, three of them, uh, two today and one on Wednesday. So it's great that you're here. I'm joined by uh, our editorial director, Kim Conniff Taber, and also the culture writer of the New York Times, uh, Rosalind Sulkers. They will do the moderation today, and then Yelena Kuya from uh, Qatar Museums will do the moderation on Wednesday. Uh, so enjoy the talks. I'm not going to say very much because I think we should get right uh, into it. Um, so I'm going to call on the Kim Conniff Taber to uh, bring her panelists for the first uh, panel. So thank you very much for being here and uh, enjoy the talks and the week. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you here. So you may have uh, noticed there's been a bit of a, a change in the program, uh, small change. A few, uh, two of our panelists, uh, original panelists, have fallen ill, unfortunately, and were actually not able to travel to Doha. Uh, Hans Ulrich Obris and Sunan uh, Fatal. Uh, but thankfully, we have a solution. Um, Shazad Dawood very graciously stepped in. Uh, to take their place, he has to take the place of two people, <laughs> so tall order <laughs> uh, for our talk here on public art today. Uh, I'm Kim Conniff Tabor, I'm the editorial director of Art for Tomorrow and of the Democracy and Culture Foundation, uh, and we're thrilled to be here with you this morning. So, um, with my esteemed panelists, so I have um, Abdul Rahman Ali Shah, uh, he's the director of public art for Qatar Museum. Ernesto Neto, uh, who's an uh, amazing uh, Brazilian artist. And as I mentioned, uh, Shazad Dawood, who is an artist based in London. So uh, we are here to talk about public art. So I thought it might be useful uh, before we dive in to discuss or to uh, at least frame what is public art. Um, so there may have been a time when the idea of public art called to mind a statue of a general on a horse in the middle of a park uh, somewhere. So we've come a long way since then. Um, now when we think of public art, we often think of outdoor sculptures, installations, maybe street art. Uh, in Paris, where I'm based, we might think of um, César's thumb at La Défense. And there's a version here in, in Doha now. Uh, maybe the steel spheres at the Palais Royal or Jean-Michel Otoniel's baubles at the metro, nearby metro, also a version now in Doha. Um, in London, we think of the Serpentine, uh, been a mainstay there for 20 years, uh, starting with Zaha Hadid uh, 22, 23 years ago. Of course, the Venice Biennale with its installations, series of murals in Hong Kong, um, and of course, there's the Prada store in Marfa, Texas. Uh, and we can even, we could easily argue that architecture is a form of public art. Uh, I think many would agree with me here in this magnificent uh, building, uh, as this museum can attest. So simply put, the defining quality of public art is simply that it's open to everyone. Uh, people from all walks of life can see it, participate, engage with it. You don't need an invitation, you don't need a museum ticket, and even quite frankly, you don't always need the desire to view the work. 
So the art is confronting the viewer. Um, the work is confronting the viewer, and sometimes when they least expect it. And that's where I think the, the magic maybe can start to happen. So here in Doha, as we know, uh, even long before the World Cup, there, was already, there were already uh, public artworks all over the city, um, spearheaded by Her Excellency Sheikh Mayasa. Uh, now there are more than 40 new works. You'll correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and I think they're up to maybe 80 a total uh, dotted all over the dotted all over um, Doha. And so hopefully you've already seen a lot of them, um, starting with the bear, Urs Fisher's giant bear at the airport. We have um, Richard Serra's steel monolith in the Brook Nature Reserve. Uh, Louise Bourgeois's monumental spider at the National Convention Center. Agal in Egal, perhaps, yes in Lucille um, by a young artist named Shuk Almana. And then we'll have these three works that are going to be unveiled later today, one by Ernesto Neto, one by our next panel speaker, Olaf Eliasson, Simone Fatal, who couldn't be here with us. Um, and so, and we're also, uh, you know, lucky enough to have two, two artists here with us today who have works here in Doha. Uh, and the architect behind this program, uh, so I'm gonna turn to Tim first, I don't wanna, I don't want to talk your ear off. I want to get to my panelists here. Um, so Abdurrahman Ali Shak is the director of public art at Qatar Museums, as I mentioned. Um, and in a, in a video interview on the Qatar Museum website, you said something that really, really struck me, um, really resonated. You said that public art by nature is not targeted to a particular demographic, but to all segments of society. So I want to start with just a very simple question that I'll pose to all of you in kind of in different forms, but uh, I want to start with you. Uh, what is the purpose of public art, in your opinion? You grab your microphone. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Um, thank you, Kim, and uh, thank you all for attending today. Um, I guess public art means different things to different uh, uh, people and uh, institutes. If we look at public art um, through history, uh, if we're looking at prehistory, Egyptian civilization or Roman, uh, early Roman, what we would find is that it was very prominent and it had its reasons. So it depends on who, who's uh, pushing for the uh, arts in the public spaces. So it, it could be uh, political reasons, um, economic, uh, ideolo ideological, but for, let's say, other museums, uh, we have our own reasons and we everything else is a side effect. Um, I think those reasons uh, that existed uh, in, in throughout history do still exist today. However, is in a more complicated or not uh, easily spotted. Um, uh, it's not visibly. It's not very visible. However, um, for Qatar Museum, the cultural institute, we look into um, the reason is purely uh, cultural. It's about bringing art, uh, making it more accessible to everyone pushing it behind, uh, bringing it out, uh, uh, from behind walls to the public. Um, and it, the, the core reason is to encourage dialogue and not having it uh, to be exclu exclusive uh, for certain uh, uh, museum or gallery goers. It should be available for everyone. And we think if that happens, people engage in dialogue because artwork, um, it has a subject, like my colleagues here, um, uh, Neto and uh, Shehzad, They've created artworks, but I assume that people will discuss other things around the artwork. Some other topics. We, um, Her Excellency, have unveiled um, Ugo, Ugo's, uh, Ugo Rindirani's uh, Doha Mountains. And people did not talk about Ugo specifically, but they talked about other topics. And this discussion, I think, is what makes public art uh, important to us in Doha, at least. So people who may not be necessarily familiar even with the artist himself uh, or herself, um, they're talking more, they're engaging more with the work. Absolutely. And it, 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 I guess people reflect what they feel against the artwork. And it's just uh, it's different from uh, uh, one society to other. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Ernesto, uh, you've had a long and 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 beautiful career that's continuing through today. You often create colorful, 
very tangible, large scale installations and galleries and museums, also outdoors. Um, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo, the Guggenheim Bilbao. Uh, and you tend to create works that take over a room or take over, completely take over the space in, in which um, they're found. Um, and people even become a part of them. One reviewer said, this is art that appeals to all the senses. Uh, it's a holistic experience, which I love. Uh, so I'm going to pose the same question to you. What is the purpose of public art? And what's different about taking a work outside, or at least out of the institution, into a more public space? Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, uh, you know, um, it's interesting because uh, I don't very much do material works outside. Uh, I very much use many times an uh, inside place like a shell, and my work happens inside of this shell. And sometimes are public here. We did a piece at the train station in Zurich. It was very public. What I think is that the public art has no this uh, interface in between the people and the, the artwork in itself. Uh, so it becomes more naked, you know, and there is this situation. Uh, how long does it uh, happens to be still being art or becomes just a furniture in the landscape of a city? Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? Uh, so this is a, a kind of uh, interesting uh, suggestion because the future uh, is always moving and you never know what something is representative today and how it's going to be tomorrow. And this is there in that place. So it's kind of something very uh, kind of a uh, uh, bet that you throw away some dice and see how it happened. And sometimes you don't even see how it happens. Yeah, because, uh, but this object is there. And there is this thing, what is this there for? And it's there to suggest uh, uh, like status things, or is there really to shake the people, to involve the people, to create uh, how some work can have new meanings uh, with new people, with new generations, how it can survive. So I think this is a, something that is quite interesting for me. But for me as an artist, you know, and the experience that I'm having here is very much an uh, experience with the landscape. You know, I think that is, is, a, is open for the public. Even the work I'm doing is even has some seats for the public to come. It's very far away. We don't know if people are going to really go or not there. But it's something really related to this uh, land, you know, to the, the land of the Zubara uh, uh, kind of desert, full of life there. Very strong place. You know, I had a week here that was very incredible, like uh, uh, making the work. We had a, at, at, by chance, it was during the full moon, you know, so it was uh, such an energy, you know, to have uh, been working there, doing a uh, heavy sun, you know, dealing with this force of the sun and the sun moving from one side to the other side and you feeling all this movement and feeling the little insects, the little plants, the plants, they are so strong, you know, some plants, they are like a round thing like that and you touch it, it's so strong, full of nails, uh, full of uh, uh, thorns, uh, that my son was telling me that the thorns are good, not just to protect from the other animals, but also to absorb the water, the moisture, you know, that I didn't know. And one day we, we had to make holes on the ground to put the, the goalposts. Uh, yeah, we that's have an there. image of that. And, and this is something very hard, uh, for somebody like me, you know, and the work that we have a, a earth cast in a ceramic, in an amazing uh, place named um, Oficina Brenan. It's a ceramist, an artist, uh, Francisco Brenan, who had passed away, and th these guys, they have huge knowledge about that in a big oven. We, 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 we burn it, named Prometeu, and there is some scratch on it. And so we're talking about planet Earth, you know, and, and what we are doing here, what's our future, what's our present. We know that we have this global warming situation and all these things. And at the same time, we are over this landscape of Baran. Uh, and, and that day we begin to dig 
to put the, the something inside of the ground. And this was very strong, you know, so we paint the, the, the concrete that's in, on pink to make it more soft, you know, because nobody's going to see that. But the earth is going to be receiving that. We make the hole, and then we put the sand back. It's like if, you, if, you're, if we are putting that in the belly of the, the earth, you know, many bellies, actually. But something that I felt like that. And in that night, this was full moon when we did all these holes, and we begin to paint the, the, the concrete uh, blocks. And at night, you know, there was, you know, millions, thousands, I don't know, of ants coming out. We need to get out, you know. The ants put us out of the landscape. It was all getting dark, you know. <laughs> and ants they took coming over. up on us. So what something, and the, the moon coming up at the same time, because it was full moon there, sunset here, the, the globe here with the ceramic globe. So it was something very incredible uh, to, to be living, you know. So I'm very thankful for this opportunity. And then there is difference. What is something on the landscape? What's something on the seat? So it's, it's I don't know, uh, hundreds of uh, possibilities of uh, public art happening and engaging the people. I think this is really great mm. to get the art out of the museums and together with the people, with the air, with the moon, the sun, the, mm. the breeze. So you're really reacting and interacting with well, the landscape and the, the community, sounds like, yeah. And the community in a very large sense, not just the people, but the <laughs> all living things in the, in the area, so. Yes, pretty much. We had this visit on the Heritage, and on the Heritage, we had this uh, understanding how was the life and how was the living uh, in that time that we didn't have air conditioning, you know, and so, uh, many techniques to survive and to live uh, in this force of the sun, uh, the heat. So this was very special, the, the softness of it, you know, uh, the feeling that you need to walk a little bit slow mm -hmm. to move in this kind of situation, which is uh, pretty much the opposite situation that we have today, with big cities, cars, lights moving everywhere, uh, you know, WhatsApp, the uh, internet, and all this. Yeah, so slow it's good down to, to yeah. appreciate the work. Thank you, thank you. That's actually a really great transition to Shazad because um, Shazad, I know that you work in many different mediums, um, and a lot of your work is looking at future scenarios, uh, considering the effects of climate change, among other things. Um, and you use painting, film. You've recently been experiment experimenting in VR, I, I think. Um, so for all of your projects, especially the site-specific works, you really spend time getting to know the community and the history of the site itself, very similar to what Ernesto just described. Um, and I think you're trying to make your projects reflect that. Um, so similar question to you, but do you consider um, all of your works in a certain way to be public art projects? Uh, and if so, do they all have the same ultimate purpose? Maybe that's a bigger question than we can answer today. But uh, I would say, uh, um, as, you've, as, as you've introduced, I suppose two of the key themes of my work are around architectures and ecologies. Mm -hmm. And they move between thinking about the built environment and the natural environment. And are all works, you know, works of public art? I think it's by degrees. So I'd almost jump on what Ernesto said as well. There's something uh, innately, I think the risk proposition of public art is magnified. You know, there's a degree to which in, in an exhibition or museum space, you have a degree of control of the total environment. So therefore, you can extend mm. more control. You know, the conditions are, are less, less dangerous. Okay. I think one part in the public sphere, I mean, if you just think of it in terms of relative footfall, you know, um, I recently had a very large public commission open at St. Pancras, London, and they get 52 million people go through there a year, which dwarfs, you know, visitor numbers for even Tate and, and others. So, you know, and in the public realm, I actually don't see it as a bad thing. I think one of the most wonderful things about works in the public realm is that 70% of people choose to ignore them. 70%? Roughly. Yeah, there's different statistics on, on the matter, but, you know, and, and I think that's wonderful because that's a good challenge. 
you know, it's, uh, and also you get a, a good 15% of people who hate them. You know, are almost you thinking, by default. That actually makes me think of one of the questions I wanted to ask later, but are you, who is the, your viewer? Who, who is the spectator that you have in mind when you're creating a work? Or does it depend on the, the space? Well, you know, it's probably easier if I go back to being a boy. I remember being a boy in London, and one of the pieces of public art that I still return to, you know, many years later is, is the Barbara Hepworth on the side of the John Lewis department store in, mm. on Oxford Street. And it's beautiful. And most people don't even know it's there. And yet those who do know it's there treasure it and love it, and it means something very special to them. And what does it mean? It's, and maybe I'm being poetic or prosaic, but it's a gateway for the imagination. Every time I walk past it, I stop, I expand, my consciousness just grows. And I think, ah, I wouldn't even like to put into words what the purpose of public art is at this moment, but there's a moment of transcendence, which I think, you know, you get, as you pointed out, in the most, in sacred architecture, in certain sites in nature, there's a, there's a moment of transcendence, which connects us all to something greater. And for me, it's almost that, how do you hold someone's hand and join them on that walk? So public art should never be an imposition. Perhaps in that way, it's humbling, because it's a different set of conditions to the gallery, where you're actually, you have to be more humble, and you actually have to say to somebody, would you like to come on a walk with me? Hmm. So it's a, it's, it shifts the role of the artist in a, in a very sort of subtle way. And I think it's, a, it's very much about how do you tell a story then? So perhaps my route to kind of engaging audiences, to sort of inviting them to come on a little walk with me, is to think about what are the stories that matter to them, rather than what are the stories that matter so much to me? And so every public art project, it's about how do I, how do I do my research? How do I do the, how do I put in the time and the work to think about who it really belongs to? And then you build from there. So to understand the space in which you're and going find, to be located. And in. find a route to that space. Mm -hmm. Find something that's meaningful. Find something that connects. And then it goes back to what Abdul Rahman was saying about dialogue. Because dialogue has to start from a point of Humility and neutrality, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, that actually for Abdul Rahman, when you're deciding which works or either commission, because I know some of the works were commissioned, but others um, were chosen to be put in the space. What what are the criteria that you use? Because I, I'm I'm sure it's different for works that are created specifically for a specific for a for a space rather than the ones that are kind of transplanted? And how does that change the interaction the public has with that work? And how is that work different than, say, I'm trying to think of a, a mammal, a spider, in another location versus a spider here in Doha? Yeah, I would love to take credit for that. But uh, <laughs> um, the truth is, um, um, I work with some uh, amazing uh, individuals that uh, make that happen and make these decisions. On top of that is um, Her Excellency, the chairperson, Sheikh al -Mayasa. I have an amazing uh, public art team with the curators who study the site and uh, based on that criteria validate if this is the correct uh, setting, if this is the correct um, uh, environment for an artwork. And of course, um, with Tom Eccles, uh, who is uh, key, who is sitting with us, he's also um, the, the the top advisor on public art. Um, so uh, the decision is not uh, singular. It's it's uh, it's a discussion internal, and uh, many factors play into how uh, an artwork uh, is placed and where it's placed and what is the narrative. And usually the narrative changes after it's installed. Mm. Uh, we we have an, a nar uh, we have a narrative that is intended by the public creates its own narrative of the, of the artwork and it's adopted. And when that happens, we think that's a success. Does the artwork itself also change during that process sometimes? I mean, Ernesto, I want to go to Ernesto for this, actually, because you, you had been talking about interacting with the environment, but I'm wondering if the, the vision, the project that you had in mind, did it transform during that process, too? Did you change the work itself? Oh, yeah. And not just for the work here in Doha. I mean, you could talk about another one if you Yes, like. yeah, the work it changed now. We never, when we begin, it's something, and then yeah, the 
the process change a little bit to what's going on. But uh, what, what I think, uh, thinking about uh, what you're talking, you know, this is very interesting what you're doing here because uh, you're really doing a public art experience here. And you really can research about that from one work to the other. Uh, what's the difference of the reaction of the public mm -hmm. and how does it work, you know, because it's like, a, it's like a, an experience, you know, you, you have this glass, uh, this bottle here, you let it fall down and see what happens. So you, you have all this public art here and now you're going to see what's happening, you're already doing it. So I think you can really uh, research and think about how it's going on because it's so many work in a, in a smaller area in a way. Uh, that can be very much uh, understandable. But what I think also that uh, the location is always very important. And, but uh, the experience I have with my own work sometimes when I change the location of the work, the work changed the, many times changed the relationship with the people. But it's still the same work, you know. So I think the idea, because this is the question, if you change the question that we were talking, if you have something, uh, forever there, you know, uh, you have this situation that sometimes it's become part of it forever and it, it's good and, I don't know, has a good relation to the people. But if you change, you sometimes, you, it, it, I think it's good to change, you know, mm -hmm. I think can uh, uh, re re regenerate uh, the place at, that it was and also the artwork that had moved to another place. So maybe some things is difficult to change, but I think this dance, I, I, I'm very much in favor of that, yeah. I have to say. How about you, Suzanne? Do you have uh, something to add to that? The works that are changing and transforming as you're installing them or as you're interacting even more with the landscape, the community, et cetera? Well, I think, I mean, one can be even more <laughs> transparent. And, you know, initially I was invited to put forward two proposals for Doha. Mm. And actually it was the other one that got chosen. And then for various reasons, it just became not structurally possible. And actually, it defaulted to what I think was the better proposal that it should have always been. Oh, interesting. So I think, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think as an artist, as a human being, you propose a number of things and then the world gives you back what it wants to. <laughs> so I think there's a way in which things, things find their natural place and even sometimes they don't. You know, I think... It's interesting how you know people hated the Eiffel Tower for a long time yeah. after it was it was completed, and I think there's also that some things it's 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 about timing, um, it's about reception, it's about many things. But also when you're thinking about something in conditions like Doha, you're you're thinking about sunlight. I mean, my work here, I I went very much into the sort of modern architectural history of Doha because that's. I'd, I'd always been actually quite fascinated by the Sheraton Hotel here as William Pereira's sort of sci-fi vision for for Doha. And I'm, I'm very interested in this moment of modernist architecture in the post-independence moment, not just in Qatar, but in many other states in the global south. I think it's, it's reflective of so much um, utopian drive for what mm. could be, and then obviously, you know, things measure up or don't accordingly in different in different territories. But I think there's something very beautiful about that utopian drive and that utopian drive for freedom, for self-realization, for self-visualization. Um, but then also, it's interesting how sometimes those buildings get forgotten, overlooked, not cherished, and also weathered over time. Yeah. You know, sun plays a part. I mean, most of the modern, the key modern buildings in Doha are are bleached from the sun. And I think it's a beautiful thing. So it's thinking about, oh, what materiality do I use to reflect that, to resonate with that? Also, dare I say it, you know, uh, one can have all sorts of ambitions for posterity, but one also has to think about maintenance and upkeep and, you know, not so exciting things for an artist to have to deal with. Engineering that goes into it, the structure, like you said, it was not structurally sound. What was the other project? Just Sorry, Sorry what was the other project that didn't? Oh my, I don't know. I'm glad <laughs> to talk about it. It was it was one for the metro, oh, and it was actually a set of uh, digital screens that were playing with evolutionary algorithms for the metro. So journeys would become infinite. Oh. 
And it was a very, you know, beautiful proposition, but um, there were delays in terms of the metro, there were uh, issues about integrating it with infrastructure that was advanced to a certain point, so it, it was not to be. So any major project you still have to deal with. Well, I think that's reality. also with public it's not art, just you know. The vision, but the reality. It's not just, you know, I was talking earlier about the difference between public conditions and museum mm -hmm. conditions, but there's also a difference between making a painting in the studio where you have, you know, a, a very large degree of control and then doing something for the public realm, where, as you say, I mean, you know, uh, you have to deal with endless rounds of engineering, structural detail. Yeah. Obviously, what I've done for Doha is a playground. So, you know, and I have kids of my own, so I was terrified of anybody being injured. You, you did this, this place that people move children yeah, with their, their architecture building, the, 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 the uh, Mayo, uh, English Mayo building, and other one, everything white. Yeah. I have seen that at night, uh, very cool. Well, Thank let's, very let's look at some of them. Uh, we now we have images here, so I, I don't want to um, but, but can, can I say something? Sure. You know, that's what's we'll coming to me. Yeah, you know, the artwork has energy, you know. Spread this energy, in my, my view, you know. And my, my feeling, you know, uh, uh, some things is difficult to move from one place to the other. You have to make foundation, dig the earth in this situation that I talk about. But, but the feeling I had that is the artwork arrive here, you know, spread this energy here. For a while, for a while. Then it moves somewhere and spread this energy somewhere else, you know. I, I think this is very help, you know. Uh, of course, sometimes it's difficult because of the foundation, but that would be my, my idea that something, that uh, more movement than stay forget, uh, forever in the same place, you know. That's what I feel. And do you think that energy permeates even if somebody is not looking at the artwork? As you said, 70% of the people don't even look at it, but is the energy... But Still there. I, I think it, it's like he, it's like his piece he has here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people, children, they're gonna play there. They maybe has no idea what right, it's about it's, there. Yeah. But the the piece, the, the 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 art that is in there, is gonna be <sighs> blowing on them. At some point, they are gonna look to this uh, English mail. Is what's the name of it? English mail. Post office. English post office, and they're gonna see the reference. And to the other thing, it's it gonna work on them, you yeah. know. It's good when it works like picking up the, uh, you know, the spirit, mm. and not exactly the intellect, you know, but go goes like subtly. It's not an analysis of yeah, the work and, and the structure they are of the work. Playing yeah. There, you know, of course, this is gonna be uh, telling them things. Blah 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 blah. Kuru kuru kuru. While you're going now on the swing up and down, and your body begin to to breathe. The, the knowledge, yeah. you know, and this is very good, I think. Okay, well, let's look at some of them, some of the works, including that one. It'll be again, let me take this work here. I know you have trouble seeing it, but this is the bear, so I don't know if you want to say a few words about the about the bear at the airport. Well, I guess um, this goes back to um, can a, a work change, an artwork mm -hmm. change the environment, and uh, what Ernesto said as well, if you move the artwork from one location to another, Will it have a different meaning? Will it have the same spirit? I think the bear is, has a spirit, uh, mm -hmm. strong spirit with the Hazaris, especially with the Hazaris. <clears throat> the intention of the bear was, um, or is, to uh, make a cold place like an airport mm. become more warm and reminds you of home. Um, right now, it means different things. It, uh, people take pictures of it when they are on holiday. It's like a jet set life. So it has I a. That it's called the sweetheart. Doha's sweetheart, or something. Doha's like sweetheart, the um, Habib al Malayin, the, the sweetheart of the million. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, it's very popular. But we believe that um, this year, um, it, it's going to uh, this art will have challenge, yeah. going to have competition. Sorry, yeah. with other artworks. Oh, because uh, they're a lot smaller. Let's move. Well, let's yeah. move to the next one. Let's see. Um, so this is Richard Serra, uh, East West West East. This goes back to what uh, the, the changing environment. Like I've been there um, every time I visit Richard Serra, it's a different environment. It's, it's, it's like a new visit. Mm. I've been there in a, a thunderstorm. I've been there where there were foxes running around, and uh, I actually was there with the shaman. And it, it's, it's, it's every time I visit, I, I actually, and, and one of the more, more interesting um, visits were where there was a locust swarm going there. 
So every time I visit, it's a, it's a desert. Every time it's um, a new experience, and when it when it when it, uh, the sun sets, the spiders come out, the the ants and the howling starts. So it's it is a, a an example of where an artwork is actually related to the environment around it. Yeah. Worth going back again and again. It sounds like. Oops, sorry. I, there was uh, the thumb. There we go. Well, the thumb is also. Um, uh, it was placed in Sugwag, where it's a very, uh, a very traditional uh, location, and the art is very contemporary. So it's, it's cr it creates this contrast, and um, uh, the, the story about engineers and installing this, um, the location we wanted to install it was different, and the reason was technical, mm -hmm. but uh, Her Excellency was insisting on changing the location, and we didn't believe in that. But when it happened, it was actually the perfect location. So sometimes engineers need to be humbled <laughs> by the actual uh, Agile. reaction. Yeah. <laughs> OK, and the ship? Well, the ship is uh, an artwork uh, created for the um, city itself. The ship is by uh, a local artist, Faraj Dham. And um, it's in Al-Wakra, in the in Al-Janoub Stadium. Al-Wakra is a, a, a city in, uh, Facing the sea, everybody there worked in the in the sea or in fishing or in uh, trade, and this is kind of like a homage mm -hmm. to the to the people in Norway. Yeah. Beautiful work, uh, and then of course everything is going to to be all right. Martin Creed. Well, this is an ex ex excellent example of um, an artwork having a different meaning. So uh, everything is going to be uh, all right by Tom Creed. When it came to Doha, it didn't mean um, what it usually means. Um, it came, um, it was installed on the first anniversary. We call it anniversary of the blockade on Doha. And uh, it kind of mimics what uh, his, uh, his Highness the Emir said that everything is going to be all right. But in Arabic, um, it, it gave a sense of security hmm. and confidence to everyone. And we were happy with it, actually. Okay, so now we're going to move to Ernesto's work. That's the earth that you were talking about. Maybe that's where the ants were coming out of, perhaps? Yeah, that's the ground. The ground is very hard, very strong, and very, very powerful, I felt. And I felt very like if my breast was like touching this ground, you know. That's, yeah, that. And then the installation that you were talking about digging. Then this is the base that I talk. We talk about is like a block, like forty by forty by forty. It's not that big, but it felt very uh, weird when it come like a concrete block with some black, uh, black asphalt to uh, protect from the water. And you know, I don't like to have hidden things in my work. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I come from uh, uh, when I was born, 1964, was the beginning of the dictatorship in Brazil. So my works always I try to be transparent and to be in balance. People can un unbuild that by their mind and see everything that's there. So putting something hidden on the ground is something very difficult for me. At the same time, this post is very much represented the goals, the the, the this cooperative structure that it, this yeah, that's when it's a foundation, right? Foundation yeah, the, the goals in itself. Because the, there is an octagon that goes for football goals, you know. That yeah. Well, here, I'll put and this the is the cooperative yeah. relation that uh, that is this difficult that we have nature and culture. You know, this power of uh, uh, ourselves, the human being, digging the earth. And then this is uh, yeah, this is the sphere, mm. uh, and the this earth. clay sphere. Temple the, Earth, the Slug Turtle Temple Earth is the yeah. title, right? Yeah. And this relation with the sun, mm. yeah, the landscape. Uh, yeah, you can really see the landscape in that experience too. there. Well, hopefully, everybody will be able to go out and see it for themselves. One more image there. And Another this view. is the, the the sunset, which is pretty much beautiful there. You know, I believe that's beautiful everywhere here because in the landscape, because the landscape is very much uh, continuous uh, from the whole country. Now we we drive up and down 
uh, every day, one hour and a half on this landscape. Very flat, very dry, very strong. So it's a very beautiful place to be and to receive this energy. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so now Shazad will have a few images here. I, I can just keep it if you want, sure, whatever it. you prefer. Uh, uh, could you, so, yeah, describe this close-up here? <laughs> so this is a close-up of a uh, Dipsistrea speciosa, or uh, my version of one. It's, it's a type of brain coral that's found in the Red Sea, and I was invited to propose a project for the canyons in Alula, which, interestingly, uh, the canyons themselves have been shaped by water over millions of years, and the very canyon where, so in terms of actually trying to be site-specific, that's, that's <laughs> super important for me, and yeah. interestingly, I was able to site the works in a part of the canyon that would have been the delta of what is now the Red Sea 11 million years ago. So that deep connection to time location is is very powerful. If you carry on, and please. Research. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of research to get. Whoops, sorry. There you go. You can actually see all the markings, the sort of carvings on the canyon wall itself are at the sea, and you know, I suppose it possibly in some ways it comes from also working in film. I'm I'm very aware of the of how enriching it is to work with a team and to be in dialogue with with other people than just myself. So, you know, I was able there to be in dialogue with local geologists, marine biologists, and and to really, you know, I, I remember the first site visit. I think everyone thought I was I was mad because, you know, it was one of those ones, probably like today, where you're driven up in a nice car and and you know everyone is looking presentable and I proceeded to get my to ruin my jeans climbing up the canyon looking for fossils because for me I wanted to find actual physical traces of shells of of you know marine creatures to kind of verify my hypothesis um, this is quite a particular project because the the corals are treated with thermochromic paint and I wanted to make people viscerally aware of human impacts on what usually remains unseen beneath the surface of the sea. So the corals actually start early morning or late at night carbon black, and according to the ambient temperature, they move through their natural underwater fluorescence to being completely bleached at the high point of temperature in the day. So this sort of process that we're normally able to ignore suddenly becomes very, very embodied. So making that. Now, if you don't mind, because I want yep. everybody to be able to see the new work. So I'm going to click through to that, if that's yep. okay, because I want to make sure we can take at least one or two questions. We are running out of time, unfortunately. So let me just, uh, I'm sure she's would be happy to explain these to everybody, but uh, let's see. Is this it? Uh, no, nope. carry on. Oh, one more. Oh, one more. There we go. This is the playground. And so this is um, this is still a render. I should have been more transparent, like Ernesto, and shown some of the on-site images. <laughs> um, it's we're still finishing up, and it's due to be unveiled on the twenty eighth. Um, it's been an amazing process of research. I mean, I talked a little bit about the architecture. Um, it was actually Abdul Rahman at when I was telling him about my fascination with William Pereira's original master plan. For for Doha, and he said, you must speak to Fatma al Sagawi, who is um, an architect, architectural historian based here in Doha, and has been working for a long time to try and preserve these buildings, get them better appreciated. And, you know, talking about collaboration, she became, you know, I, the project couldn't have happened without her. And for me, that's really important because it means it has a reason, you know, mm -hmm. to exist here. And you and can really see the influence so, as you're talking about the art architecture of the surrounding buildings and how that kind of fed into your idea yeah. for this. And I think even to say something, um, to carry on with what Ernesto was saying earlier, what, what you do about things just sort of percolating, you know, and you were right, you know, kids might not make the immediate connection, but you, you think about, oh, if that's one of your primary audiences, what do you do? Mm. So I actually just... Um, there's some set parameters for scale for children's playgrounds. And obviously, as an artist, you have to stick to those. So I just magnified each play structure because I thought, what is the relationship of a child's body to my playground and the playground's relation to the buildings it references? And that became 
just uh, oh, and so it, it built out from there. That it it your... became this sort of yeah proportional relationship, and I think those subtle qualities of how you think about space are a kind of just that quiet poetics that you can bring in as an artist. No, oh, so then and, and again, it, it was interacting with your environment and taking in being able to have that, that nourish you. And that is the idea of playing. Playing, mm -hmm. playing is great. You know, play, let's play. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great note to end on. Now let me just see if there was one or two questions. We're really short on time, but I'd love to take a, a question or two from the audience if there are any. I think we have a roving mic. Anyone have a question? If not, we'll just end it because it's almost the end here. Raise your hand. Show of hands. Well then we'll end on the note of play. I think that's a perfect that's the perfect end. Let the children <laughs> let <laughs> them play. Let the children play. Let the children let the children let them play. Let the children play. Let the children. That's Carlos Santana from Moonflower. I love it. Well, thank you so much to all of you. This was a great discussion. I had, we could have gone on a lot longer, but we will have to end. We have um, our next panel. Um, we'll have a short break, but then Roz and Silkis will come up with Oliver Eliason and um, Her Excellency Sheikh Amayasa. So see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>